Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this lecture. My name is Tony Symes. I organize the monthly lectures for the Herschel Society. The title is Decoding the Biographies of Binary Black Holes with Gravitational Waves, and the lecture is Dr. Isabel Romero Shaw. Tonight, we're especially proud to welcome the right worshipful, the Mayor of Bath, Councillor Dina Romero, to the lecture, which is a first for the Herschel Society, at least in my time. Uh, the Herschel, uh, the, the mayor is also the mother of the lecturer. <laughs> the Herschel holds its lectures here with the support of the Bath Royal Literary and Scientific Institution. The Herschel Society brings together like-minded people who are interested both in modern astronomy and the historical contribution of the extraordinary Herschel family to this subject. And we would welcome new members. I've put some flyers out on the seats. Please note that the lecture is being recorded. For those in the room, if the fire alarm sounds, please proceed out the way that you came in, down the stairs, and keep right until you come to a small patch of grass on Chapel Row. We'll assemble there. An alternative exit route is at the back of this room, through the Lonsdale room and down the stairs number 18. For those on Zoom, please stay on mute and with video off during the lecture. You can turn your microphone and video stream back on for the Q&A session. You can put questions in the chat channel at any time to be answered when the lecture has finished. Now looking ahead, in February on the 2nd, we have Nicholas Pallet, who's here, second from the front, uh, giving us a lecture on Johannes Kepler, his life and work. Uh, the next uh, really notable event is on June the 8th, we're having an all-day conference on John Herschel. That will be on a Saturday. Back to tonight. Isabel is a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Cambridge, where she studies gravitational waves from the collisions of black holes and sometimes neutron stars. Previously, Isabel did her PhD at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia, and has her MSci in physics from the University of Birmingham. Let me hand over to Isabel. Thank you. Thank you, Tony, and thank you to all of you for being here today as well. Um, so I am Isabel. Um, I'm a Herschel Smith Fellow at the University of Cambridge in the Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics. And I'm also a member of the LIGO Collaboration, which is a very large collaboration that aims to detect and interpret gravitational waves from merging compact objects and also from other astronomical events. <laughs> So as was previously mentioned, I, uh, I'm from Bath originally. I grew up in Bath. I went to Moreland's Infant School, Moreland's uh, Junior School. And then I went to Ralph Allen for my secondary education before going to the University of Birmingham for my undergraduate and master's in physics before moving to Melbourne for my PhD. Then I came back and I now live and work in Cambridge. Um, in the same department, actually, that several influential people in the field of gravity and black holes have worked in it in the past. For example, Isaac Newton and Stephen Hawking have both worked in the department that I work in today. So a very sketchy outline of the talk today. Um, first, I'll tell you kind of the fundamentals of black holes and gravitational waves. I know that we have a very broad range of expertise and background knowledge in the audience. So hopefully there'll be something in this talk for everyone, but I just wanted to make sure that we were starting on the same kind of plane. So we'll be starting with the fundamentals. Then I'll go through a kind of history lesson on the history of black holes, gravitational waves, and our understanding of those things. Then I'll talk about how we detect gravitational waves and how we interpret them. And following on from that, I'll talk about how we interpret them and how we use these interpretations to tell us about the lives of black holes and neutron stars. And finally, at the end, there'll be a question and answer session. 
So to start with, what is a black hole? Well, a black hole is the end product of the life of some stars, not all stars, but some stars. And a star is made up of a lot of fuel that's driving um, fusion. And that fusion is creating a lot of radiation pressure, which holds the star up against the force of its own gravity. But when the star runs out of fuel, it no longer has that radiation pressure holding it up. And so all it's acting under is the influence of its own gravity. So when it gets to the end of its life, it's run out of fuel. A star can go through multiple processes and it can become multiple end products. It can become nothing. It could become a white dwarf. Our own sun will probably become a white dwarf. This is luminous because it still has some residual thermal energy, um, but it's not actually fusing anything. It's not creating any more energy. It could become a neutron star. A neutron star is an incredibly dense object. A teaspoon of neutron star, I think, weighs 10 million tons. It's very, very dense, but it's still luminous. You can still see it. Or it could become a black hole. And as we know, black holes cannot be seen. So a black hole only forms as the end product of a particularly massive star. So these stars are something like eight times the mass of the sun or above. Throughout their lives, stars will expand. The particularly massive stars will expand more than the lower mass stars, but even our sun will expand during its lifetime. And when it expands and becomes a red giant, its, uh, its radius, its outer extent, will be even larger than the orbit of the Earth. So if the Earth is still around at that time, the sun will burn it up to a nice little crisp. Then at the end of a massive star's life, it will likely explode. Depending on how massive it is, it may explode in several stages. It may just directly collapse. But whatever it does, it's likely to lead to a black hole. So why is a black hole black? Why can't we see it? And to talk about why we can't see a black hole, we really need to talk about how gravity works. So we're all familiar with the concept of gravity. My brother told me earlier, if I throw something up, it comes down. Very smart. He's onto something. Um, but gravity is quite complex. And a way to think about how gravity works is to think about a rubber sheet. And if you place a heavy object, for example, a bowling ball on that rubber sheet, it deforms the rubber sheet. And if you took a smaller object, like a golf ball, and rolled it towards the bowling ball, it would fall into the well that the bowling ball had created. And this is kind of how gravity works. So in this image, the sun is acting like that big bowling ball, and the earth is acting a bit like that golf ball. But in this case, the earth has enough momentum pushing it around the sun, pushing it sideways, that it doesn't fall into the sun's gravitational well, it just stays there orbiting. It is losing a little bit of energy, but it's not losing it at a rate that at least we can see on, on the scale of our lifetimes. And Einstein summed up this effect by saying, matter tells space-time how to curve and space-time tells matter how to move. And this also applies to light. So light follows these geodesics, these uh, paths of shortest uh, distance, and actually curves in relation to the masses in space-time. So the reason that a black hole is black is because it deforms space-time so much. So if we look at this diagram here, we have the sun and it's deforming space-time a little bit. It has this dent. But actually, because the sun is very massive and very large, the, um, the acceleration that light feels isn't that great. The escape velocity of the sun is below the speed of light. So we can see the sun. A neutron star is around the same mass as the sun, but it's much smaller. And so it deforms space-time to a much greater extent. We can still see a neutron star, but light slows down a lot more when it passes a neutron star than it does when it passes the sun. And finally, we come to a black hole. A black hole deforms space-time an awful lot because a black hole is essentially squeezing a lot of mass into an infinitely small space. And so it deforms space-time to such an extent that the escape velocity of a black hole exceeds the speed of light. And so we can no longer see this object. So I apologize in advance for the maths on the screen, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about how big a black hole is. Because in general relativity, a black hole is an infinitely small point. 
But when we actually think about a black hole, we often think of the event horizon. And the event horizon is the ring of lights at the points beyond which light can no longer escape. So the Schwarzschild radius describes how big this ring is. It describes the radius of that ring. And for the sun, if we compress the sun into a black hole, if we compressed it so much that its escape velocity no longer was below the speed of light, it would be about three kilometers. It would be about three kilometers wide. So if the center of the Schwarzschild radius was right here, the outer extent of the Schwarzschild radius would be about at the University of Bath. Whereas for the Earth, if we compress the Earth to a size where we can no longer see it, where its escape velocity exceeded the speed of light, it would be about the size of a large pea. Not a petit pois, but a garden pea, something of that extent. So hopefully we're now all on the same page with respect to gravity, but what are gravitational waves? Gravitational waves occur when these masses that are deforming space-time move, when they accelerate. And this is because gravity does not travel instantaneously. The speed of gravity is the same as the speed of light. And this means that when you move something in space-time, the effect propagates outwards at a finite speed. And this looks something like this. So in this graphic, we have two, I think they're supposed to be neutron stars, moving around each other and causing these ripples Sorry, let's go back and just talk about this for a second. Hmm. Causing these ripples to propagate outwards. And what these ripples are actually doing is they're taking away energy from the orbit. So over a very, very long time, these two dense objects are going to be losing energy through gravitational radiation and moving closer and closer together. And this will be important um, for something that I'll talk about later on. Okay, so in popular media and popular culture, gravity and black holes are things that are quite well popularized and even quite well understood by the general public these days. So on this screen, I've just put a number of different films, books, games, comics that have involved some kind of reference to gravity or black holes. In fact, this picture up in the top right is a picture of a fish and chip shop that I saw recently in Dursley, which is called Gravity. And I think if you can call a fish and chip shop, gravity, then you can, you can assume that people understand the concept quite well. But this wasn't always the case. So we start our timeline of gravity with Isaac Newton, who published the law of gravitational attraction in 1687. But he actually started thinking about this quite a lot earlier, while he was a student at Cambridge. And he started thinking about it during an outbreak of the bubonic plague when Cambridge was shut and everyone was working from home. So he was working from home when he discovered the law of gravitational attraction. So uh, what were you doing when you were working from home? <laughs> um, so this also brings us to our first quiz question. True or false? The law of gravity was discovered before the piano had been invented. If you think true, raise your hand. How about if you think false, now raise your hand. Okay. It was actually true. The piano was invented 22 years after Newton discovered the law of gravity, which I think is amazing because pianos to me seem like something that's existed for an incredibly long time, but apparently gravity has existed for even longer. Uh, okay. So around a hundred years later, John Mitchell came along and he was an English country parson and he actually taught Hebrew, Greek and geology, I think at Cambridge. So he wasn't really a physicist, but he was thinking about physics. And he actually realized that if you had a substantially massive object, then light wouldn't be able to escape from it. If its escape velocity exceeded the speed of light. So he didn't actually reach the conclusion that such a massive object would collapse under the influence of its own gravity, but he was going along the right lines to think if something has an escape velocity that is larger than the speed of light, we won't be able to see that object. Around 130 years later, along comes Albert Einstein, really the, the person that we think about most in this association with this field. And he came up with his theory of general relativity in 1915, and then he predicted the existence of gravitational waves in 1916, which brings us to the second quiz question. True or false? The toggle light switch was invented the year before Einstein predicted gravitational waves. If you think true, Raise your hand. 
<laughs> if you think false, raise your hand. I'm doing both. <laughs> It's false. The toggle light switch was invented the year afterwards. And so you can kind of understand why Einstein thought we would never detect gravitational waves because this was the technology he was dealing with. So very shortly after Einstein published his gravitational wave prediction um, and his theory of general relativity, Schwarzschild came along and wrote the solution for a spherically symmetric um, deformation of space-time that describes a black hole that is non-spinning. Um, a little while after that, Kerr came along and predicted the solution for a black hole that's spinning. And we call a spinning black hole a Kerr black hole, and we call a non-spinning black hole a Schwarzschild black hole. In 1939, um, Oppenheimer, who is quite a famous man, he recently had a film uh, made about him, and his collaborator Snyder um, realized that a star would collapse under its own gravity once it stopped um, fusing its fuel, once it stopped supporting itself with radiation pressure. They didn't quite connect this to Einstein's black holes, but they did, again, go along the right direction in finding out what a black hole is. Next, we come to 1962. So in this year, the first quasar was identified. A quasar is a quasi-stellar object. For a long time, people thought that quasars were just luminous stars, but it turned out that quasars were the active centers of very, very distant galaxies that are powered by the accretion of the supermassive black holes at their centers. And this is the first quasar that was identified. This is not the image that was taken when the quasar was first identified, but it is the same one. Um, and this uh, quasar at the time was of interest to a British astronomer called Cyril Hazard. And Cyril Hazard had commissioned some time on the Parkes radio telescope in Australia. But when he got to Australia, he took the wrong train in New South Wales and he went in the wrong direction. And so he had to rely on the Australian technicians at the telescope to actually do the observing for him. And it turned out that this object was very, very difficult to observe because it was very low on the horizon. And the Parkes radio telescope is surrounded by trees. So they had to chop down a bunch of trees and they also had to remove some of the safety bolts from the telescope in order to actually observe this object. They did it and this was the first quasar to be identified. A couple of years later in 1964, Anne Ewing was the first person to use the term black holes to describe what we would now call a black hole. So often this uh, coining of the term is attributed to John Wheeler from Princeton, but he didn't actually publish this until four years afterwards. So I think Anne Ewing should get the credit for this. And she was actually reporting on a conference of physicists where this word, this term had clearly been being used beforehand. She actually talks in this article about degenerate stars, which is a term that's sometimes used for things like black holes and neutron stars. And she clarifies that degenerate stars are not Hollywood types with poor morals in the article, which I find quite amusing. Um, a few years later, Joseph Weber came up with the first attempt to actually detect gravitational waves. And this was a cylinder of aluminium, several cylinders of aluminium that were designed to resonate with the frequency of gravitational waves when they passed through. And he actually claimed that he had made detections, but these detections were never um, repeated by anyone else. They were never validated. So we don't think this was actually real. But my question to you, is whether the first gravitational wave detector was built before email was invented. If you think it was, raise your hand. And if you think it wasn't, raise your hand. <laughs> the answer is that email was invented three years after the Weber bar. Okay, so in 1972, Cygnus X1 was detected. So Cygnus X1 is an X-ray binary. It's a black hole that's accreting matter from a stellar companion, and it's releasing emission in X-rays in the process. So this was when Cygnus X1 was detected. This isn't when it was identified as a black hole. This didn't happen until sometime afterwards, but it was the first object. It was the first system to be identified as containing a black hole later on. And in 1972 was also when Brain of Weiss started designing his first gravitational wave interferometer, which would precede the interferometers that we actually use today, which I'll talk more about later. In 1974 was when Holson Taylor made their very famous binary pulsar discovery. So a pulsar is a neutron star that's spinning very rapidly, 
and releasing a big jet of electromagnetic radiation. And the reason we call it a pulsar is because it works like a lighthouse. It's constantly emitting this jet, but we only detect it when that pulse sweeps past the Earth. And so we detect it as a pulse. And the reason this detection was really important was because there were two of them. And because there were two of them in a binary together, we could use their pulses to measure the deterioration of their orbits as predicted by general relativity, by gravitational waves. <laughs> so in this plot, which was made in the years following their detection, looking at the same system, we have the year on the x-axis and then the decrease in the orbital separation on the y-axis. The dots are showing the measurements and the curve is showing the prediction from general relativity. And this was a really stunning plot because it just shows how perfectly Einstein had predicted how these systems work, how they lose energy through gravitational waves. In 1983, the design study for LIGO was complete. And in 1993, Hulse and Taylor got the Nobel Prize for their discovery. Here they are looking very happy about that. And in 1994, the LIGO detectors commenced construction. So the top one is the LIGO detector in Livingston in the US, and the bottom one is the LIGO detector in Hanford. So these are showing the central stations and then the four kilometer long arms of these detectors. Quiz question number four. Isabel, me, is older than the LIGO gravitational wave detectors, which were built in 1994. <laughs> My family in the room have an unfair advantage here. So raise your hand if you think I'm older than the LIGO detectors. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> Raise your hand if you think I'm younger than the LIGO detectors. My mother answered this wrong. <laughs> she, was, she was tricking you all. This is me when I was a baby, so I clearly always loved a, a jumpsuit. Uh, yeah, so in 2002, the LIGO test run started. The LIGO detectors were upgraded in 2010 to their advanced sensitivity. And in 2015, the design sensitivity was reached. This was very exciting. The detectors were turned on for the first time with some expectation that we might actually detect something. And three days after the detectors were turned on, the first gravitational wave was detected from a binary black hole. This was astonishing at the time. And in fact, it took a whole year of analysis of this, of this single detection to convince the entire collaboration that this is actually a detection um, and that we could publish it and tell the world. So this was also, I think, the fastest Nobel Prize to ever be awarded. Um, the detection was made in 2015. It was announced in 2016. And by the end of 2016, um, Barry Barish, Rainer Weiss, and Kip Thorne had been given the Nobel Prize in physics for the detection of gravitational waves. And my final quiz question to you <laughs> is whether the Nintendo Switch was released the year after the Nobel Prize was awarded to these three men for the detection of gravitational waves. Raise your hand if you think it was. And raise your hand if you think it wasn't. It's true. <laughs> Um, and yeah, I just think if only Einstein could see the technology that we're working with today, maybe he would have had more faith in our ability to detect gravitational waves. Okay, so the first and second observing runs happened in 2015 and 2017. This gave us 11 gravitational wave signals in total, including the first detection of a binary neutron star, which was very exciting because it also came with a bunch of electromagnetic counterparts, which I'll talk about a bit later. The third observing run was in 2019 to 2020. This took our total gravitational wave signal number up to 91. And this included the first neutron star black hole binary. So binaries where there's a neutron star and a black hole crashing together. Also in this, uh, I think in 2020, the first photo of a supermassive black hole was released by the Event Horizon Telescope. This is the picture on the left. This is M87, the black hole at the center of M87. And also on the right is a photo of the black hole at the center of our galaxy, Sagittarius A star. And also in this year, um, Andrea Gez, uh, Reinhard Genzel, and that man's name, whose name I've forgotten. What's his name? Oh, it's just slipped my mind. Quiz question, <laughs> anyone know? <laughs> Roger Penrose, Roger Penrose, sorry. He's the most famous one. 
they got the Nobel Prize for their work on black holes, um, including uh, for Andrea and Reinhard, showing that the dense object at the center of our galaxy is likely a black hole. Okay, so how do we see black holes? Traditionally, we would infer the presence of black holes through gravitational lensing. So in the uh, lower left over there, you can see an artist's impression of what it would look like if a black hole went across our view of the Milky Way. You can see it bending the light there due to its gravity. We could see them through accretion. So here we have an artist's impression of Cygnus X1. It's accreting from its companion star and it's releasing a lot of energy in X-rays. And so we can see it through, through that and we can infer its presence through that. And this is a video of the stars at the center, the very center of our galaxy. And you can see, especially with this one here, that it's orbiting something that's invisible. You can see it going around there. There's nothing there, but it's orbiting it. And so we will be able to see, or we will be able to infer the presence of black holes by looking at their influence on the surrounding stars. Of course, nowadays, we can also see black holes if they're in binaries through their gravitational wave emission. So again, this is an artist's impression. It shows two black holes orbiting each other and the effect this has on the light from the background stars. So we don't actually see this kind of thing. Um, when black holes are moving around each other, we can't resolve them this well on the sky. But it is important to notice the effect that it has on light because the lights from those stars are following the curvature of the waves. And we really rely on the way that light behaves with the deformations of gravity to actually detect these things. Okay, so when it comes to actually detecting gravitational waves, what do we do? Well, you have your gravitational waves passing through the universe, stretching and squeezing spacetime. And the effect that this has on free floating objects is to change the distance between them. Now, each of those objects won't notice that they're moving. If you and your friend are in your spacesuits and you're floating in the universe, you won't notice that the distance between you is changing. But the distance between you is changing, it's stretching and squeezing. So when a gravitational wave passes through the solar system, the distance between the Earth and the sun changes by about the same distance as the diameter of a gold atom. So it's an extremely small change that we're looking to detect. And this is why Einstein didn't think we would ever be able to detect them. Space-time is very stiff, and so the changes are very small. These are our current detectors. We have the LIGO detectors in Hanford and Livingston in the US. We have Virgo in Italy. We also have CAGRA in Japan, which is currently operational, but is not currently sensitive enough to make any detections. We have GEO in Germany, which is not designed to be sensitive enough to make detections, but it's really good for testing the technology that we want to use at the other detectors. And then there are also a couple of detectors planned for India and for Australia. And inside these detectors, this is what happens. You have a laser. The laser beam is split down the two arms. The arms are roughly four kilometers in length and there are mirrors at the end of each arm. When the light travels down each arm and the distance between the mirror and the beam splitter changes, that will show up as an interference effect when the two beams recombine and shine onto the light collecting plate. So you can see this happening in this video. The light shines up, it reflects, and it shines onto the light collecting plate. When the mirrors move, it changes the interference pattern. And we interpret this as a strain signal. So a strain signal is a change in length divided by the original length. So a fractional change in length, if you will. And this signal tells us what the binary looks like. So you can see here, we have a classic in spiral merger ring down signal. We're seeing the amplitude and the frequency both increase as the binary gets closer and closer together. The maximum amplitude is at the merger when the event horizons touch. And then there's a ring down. And this is when the two objects have merged and they're settling into their final state. So we can use this to tell us what the binary looks like. We can interpret, we can decode what the binary looks like if we have a good understanding of the signals that we should expect given a variety of different sources. So this is the data from the first detection 
we have the data from Hanford in red and the data from Livingston in blue. And what I'm gonna show you is essentially the process that we do. We do a process called parameter estimation, which sounds fancy, but it's not really because we're basically just using what we know about how the signals should look. So for example, we know that with a higher distance, if we place our source further away, we expect a lower amplitude signal. We also expect that if we have higher masses in our binary, then this, the gravitational wave should have a lower frequency. So this doesn't look like a good fit. It looks like the amplitude is too high, so it's probably too close, and the frequency is too low, so it's too massive. This source is too massive. Now we've placed our source too far away, and the frequency is still too low. So it's still too far away, it's still too massive, and it's also too far away. Now we've managed to match up the amplitude, so this is probably the right distance, but it looks like it's too massive because the frequency is too low. Now we've made the frequency too high, so th this means that our source is probably too light. And finally, we've managed to match up both the right distance and the right mass. And this is essentially the process of parameter estimation, um, although we do this with 17 parameters, not with two. So it's a little bit tricky. This is that data again, just in a slightly different format. Um, and this is a screenshot of a tweet of a screenshot of an email, which came out before the press release that actually announced this detection. So it's essentially saying, hi everyone, the LIGO rumor seems to be real and it's going to come out on February 11th. Um, spies who've seen the paper say that they've seen gravitational waves the significance is 5.1 sigma. So the sigma is just a significance threshold. And generally in science, we don't claim detections, confident detections until the significance is over five sigma. The black hole masses were 36 and 29 times the mass of the sun. And the final black hole was 62 solar masses. So if you are very quick at maths, you'll notice that 36 plus 29 does not equal 62. What happened to those other three solar masses? Well, they were transformed into gravitational waves and they were emitted across the universe and we detected some of them. So when this was detected to begin with, we really thought it was too good to be true because we'd only just turned on the detectors and they weren't even supposed to be observing anything yet. They were in engineering mode. So they were just sort of being tested in preparation for the real observing run. But there was also this other element, which was that sometimes at the detectors, the technicians would do hardware injections, which means that they would fake a signal, basically. And this would be to test what the community would do and what, how they would behave, how they would process the data, whether they would be able to write the publication, what kind of um, test they would do. And this had happened before. There was, a, uh, there was an injection called the black dog, which went through this whole process and people thought it might be real. And then right at the very end, it was revealed that it was actually a hardware injection. But the scientist who actually saw this data first knew that the hardware injection process at the detectors wasn't working. It wasn't set up, so it couldn't have been a hardware injection. So this was really very exciting. And even though the hardware injection wasn't set up, and even though they were very confident in it, it still took a year for them to process it and for it to be fully analyzed. This is just another quick timeline because I think it's kind of fascinating that these black holes actually merged 1 billion years ago. And then these gravitational waves were just traveling across the universe towards us at the speed of light throughout our entire evolution <laughs> from multi-celled organisms on the earth 600 million years ago through to today. These gravitational waves have been traveling across the universe for us to just develop the right technology three days before they hit us, it's just, it's just incredible. Okay, so what I'm going to show you next is a time frequency spectrogram. <clears throat> this sounds intense, but it's not, it's just time on the x-axis, frequency on the y-axis, and then the signal itself is shown in colors that represent the intensity of the signal at that point. So I think it's gonna play through twice. Um, the first time it plays through, it will play um, at the frequency that it was detected. So another cool thing about gravitational waves is that they actually are in the human hearing range. So when you play them, when you play the data, you can hear it. And the second time it plays through, it will be at a higher frequency. So you'll be able to hear it a bit better. So hopefully this works. Oh. Okay. Can you hear that?
Okay, so that is the sound of the first binary black hole detection. Now I'm going to play you the sound from the first binary neutron star detection. And this has had no frequency tampering at all. This is just the frequency it was detected at. These objects are much lighter, so the frequency is higher. And so you can hear more details initially anyway. The time frequency spectrogram will show in the bottom panel. And in the top panel, you'll see the data from Fermi, which is a gamma ray telescope, which detected some of the electromagnetic counterpart to this event. That's the sound of a binary neutron star merging. That wasn't the sound that the gamma ray made. That's just there for a kind of comic effect. Um, yeah, so on the left here is a graphic from the Hubble Space Telescope showing how this kilonova appeared over a few different days. And you can see it really growing in intensity there. And then here on the right, we just have the time frequency spectrogram of the gravitational wave signal. And then above that, several different electromagnetic counterpart events. So this was really exciting for many, many reasons. It proved that a lot of heavier elements are actually produced in kilonova events, like gold, for example. Um, and it meant that we could do a lot of tests to do with how fast um, gravity travels and confirm a lot of things about general relativity in the process. You'll notice here that the electromagnetic counterparts come after the gravitational wave signal. And this is because the gravitational wave signal follows the in spiral and the merger and the ring down. And the light emission happens a little bit afterwards. The jet is launched through a few different physical processes that happen as the result of the merger. And it takes a little while for that to happen. And then it also takes a little while for the light to escape from the cloud of stuff around <laughs> the kilonova. So that's why there's a little bit of a time offset there. So, we have detected a lot of gravitational waves now. We're currently in the fourth observing run. We've had the third observing run. We have around 91 gravitational wave detections now. This is the stellar graveyard plot. It shows all of the black holes and neutron stars that we know about in the universe, including those that were detected through electromagnetic observations and also those that were detected through gravitational wave observations. So you can see here in the blue, we have all of the binary black holes that have been detected with gravitational waves. And what you'll notice in this plot is that for the gravitational wave events, we have both the um, component masses and also the mass of the object that it merged to create. So the mass is shown on the y-axis here, so the heavier objects are higher up on the plot. So we have a few binary neutron stars, a couple of events that contain one neutron star and one black hole that merge into a black hole. And then we have a whole lot of binary black holes. And this is the source of a really big mystery in gravitational wave astrophysics, which is where do all of these binaries come from? This is something that we still don't know. And this is what I work on. So it's really hard to make black holes collide with each other. And this is because in order to make two black holes smash into each other on the time scale of the universe, so on a time scale that we can actually detect, they need to be about a fifth of the distance from the Earth to the Sun to make this happen. And this is a challenge, because if you have two stars that are this close together, they'll probably destroy each other during the course of their evolution. They'll expand, they'll go supernova, they'll either destroy their partner or they'll push their partner away. And so you end up with just one black hole at the end. On the flip side, if you start with two stars that are far enough away from each other, that they can go through their evolution to black holes without destroying each other or influencing their orbit at all, they'll be too distant to merge within the age of the universe. So what do we do? There are two primary channels that we talk about when we try to get around this problem. The first is isolated evolution. So in this case, you do have two stars that evolve together in isolation, not influenced by anything else. And there are certain evolutionary processes that they can go through to force them to be far apart when they're going through all of this evolution that can disrupt them and then closer together later on when they go on to merge with binary black holes. I can talk more about this in the question time if you like. I'm not going to focus on it too much today. I've worked on this a little bit, but not as much as I've worked on the other channel, which is the dynamical channel. So in the dynamical channel, 
we have black holes that evolve into black holes before they meet each other. So in this case, the black holes are living in a densely populated environment. So something like a globular star cluster or the accretion disk of a supermassive black hole or something like that, where there's a lot of stars and a lot of stellar remnants. And in such an environment, two black holes can become bound to each other. And then they can also interact with other objects. And every time a pair of black holes interacts with another object, that object comes in, goes past the binary, and removes some of its orbital energy and converts it into its own kinetic energy. So the interloper escapes with a higher velocity and the binary gets closer. And so several subsequent interactions of this type lead the binary to become closer and closer and closer on a very fast time scale. And so this can lead to very rapid mergers, such as the kinds of binary black hole mergers that we see. Here are just some pretty pictures of some potential dynamical formation environments. Um, Globular clusters are one of them. There are several hundred globular clusters per galaxy. Galactic centers are another. Obviously, there's only one of these per galaxy, but they are much bigger and denser than globular clusters. And then you can also have supermassive black hole accretion disks um, in galactic centers as well. So these are the kind of environments we're interested in. These can be quite difficult to simulate, which makes inferring what happens inside them quite difficult. And they can also be quite hard to image because they're so densely populated. So they're a little bit of a challenge, but we're learning more about them through gravitational waves. Okay, so there are certain properties that we can look for, as well as the masses and distances, we can infer other properties from the gravitational waves. And certain properties can tell us about the formation of these binaries. So firstly, we have spins. In the isolated case, you have two black holes that have evolved together, they've interacted tidally, They've inherited the angular momentum of their predecessors and of their environments. And so we expect them to have spins that are aligned both with each other and with the orbital angular momentum of the binary itself. Whereas in the dynamical case, these black holes know nothing about each other. So if they have a spin, it is unlikely to be related to the spin of their partner in any way. So they can be misaligned. And in fact, from a globular cluster, which is spherically symmetric, we expect as a whole, the population of binary black holes that come from this environment to have an isotropically distributed range of spins. So the spin angles can take any direction and we expect to see an equal distribution of these directions over the full population. We call these processing spins because of this misalignment causes the orbital plane to process and this shows up in the signal. We can also look to the masses so in the isolated case, there is an upper limit, a natural upper limit to the mass of a black hole that can form through stellar evolution. This limit also exists in the dynamical case. However, in the dynamical case, if your black hole remnant, if the two black holes merge and they form this other black hole, if this more massive remnant can be kept inside that environment, it can go on to merge again. And this can lead to a buildup of much more massive black holes. So more massive black holes can also be um, revealing that they've formed dynamically. And finally, we have the orbital eccentricity. So this refers to the shape of the orbit. If the orbit is more kind of squashed, more egg-shaped, it's more highly eccentric. In the isolated case, these black holes have lived together for a really long time. And gravitational waves are super efficient at removing energy from orbits. So gravitational waves will have reduced the eccentricity of that orbit such that we don't expect to see any eccentricity in binaries that form through isolated evolution. Whereas in the dynamical case, because these binaries are pushed together so rapidly, they can still retain the orbital eccentricity. They don't have time to lose their orbital eccentricity before they merge. So orbital eccentricity is the key thing that I actually focus on in my work um, for looking for dynamical binaries. This is a video that I show in every talk that I do, just because I really like it. Mm -hmm. um, it's by Johan Samsing, who works a lot on dynamical binaries. It's showing the interaction of three 10 solar mass black holes in something like a globular cluster, and it's showing how they interact. And you might notice, as these black holes interact with the third object, their orbit has become less circular. It's gotten more eccentric. There's definitely a period where they're passing very close together and going very fast. And then there's a period where they're further apart and going much more slowly. Now they're entering into a chaotic interaction where it's not really clear 
which the bound binary is and which the third body is. It doesn't really matter in this case. Eventually, a pair will split off and they'll go on to merge. Um, and this binary would have had detectable eccentricity um, when we detected its uh, gravitational radiation. So when we look for orbital eccentricity in the signals, this is what we look for. On the left, we have the classic gravitational wave signal from a circular binary with the frequency and the amplitude just increasing monotonically with time. In the eccentric case, because the binary is closer together and then further apart again, it's more strongly emitting gravitational waves when it's closer together, and then this decreases when it's further apart. So you end up with this amplitude and phase modulating effect. And this is what we look for. So do we actually have any dynamically formed binaries? What have we actually seen? So this was the most exciting event um, from the third observing run, at least in my opinion. Um, this is 1905-21. This was an extremely massive merger. So its components were something like 90 and 65 solar masses. Um, so it merged to form actually what we called the first directly observed intermediate mass black hole a black hole that had more than 100 solar masses. And you'll notice that this is an extremely short signal. And this is because it's so massive. It's really, really low frequency. So if I play you the audio, you may not even hear it. That was it. Did, did you hear that? No, mom says no. <laughs> okay, so I'll increase the frequency. So that's with the frequency increased 200 times. And you might have heard that there was a little bit of wobbling there. And that's because we think it might have some orbital eccentricity making this modulation. And I'm very proud of uh, myself and my team for working on this event. And actually, I'm going to show you this snippet from Wikipedia because it's really surreal to me that my name is on Wikipedia. Um, but it says that we show that the data is better described by an eccentric waveform than the circular model, which is very exciting. So we also looked at some other events, for evidence of eccentricity. Um, we found four in the third observing run that had some evidence for eccentricity, some evidence that they were dynamically formed. Um, and then this was also supported by several other studies um, that showed that Particularly 1905-21 was consistent with eccentricity, but then there were also other studies that showed that these three and perhaps several others also were consistent with having some orbital eccentricity. So perhaps were dynamically formed. Um, there's also some evidence coming from the spins. So I don't normally focus on spins, but I did actually contribute to this work a little bit. Um, this is looking at the spins of uh, 200129. And this event seems to have extremely misaligned spins. So the spins are causing this orbital plane precession that you can see in this video by VJ Varma. And you can also see the modulation in the gravitational wave signal that the processing effect has, that the orbital plane precession has on the signal. Okay, so we're sort of nearing the end of the talk now. So I wanted to talk a bit about what the future of gravitational wave astrophysics looks like. So my friend Floor Brokegarden made this fantastic animation. And it shows how the numbers of detections will keep creeping up um, in future observing runs and with future detectors. So we've been through 01 and 02, observing run 1 and observing run 2, and observing run 3. We're currently in observing run 4. And we expect to have on the order of hundreds of binary black hole detections by the end of 04, and somewhere around 10 to 20 binary neutron star and black hole neutron star binaries by the end of 04 as well. Going forwards, we expect this number to increase in observing run five, but the technology won't have increased that much, so it will probably double or something in 05. Voyager is an extension to the existing detectors, so it will be better, but it won't be as good as Cosmic Explorer and the Einstein telescope, which will be tens of times larger than the existing detectors. And so we'll have much higher sensitivity and will give us millions of events by the end of their first observing run. Okay, so I can see that my Mac is going to die soon, so I might have to plug it into a power outlet, but just very quickly, 
Um, there was a detection announced in the last year, which talked about evidence for a stochastic gravitational wave background from the pulsar timing array. Um, the significance of this is currently below that five sigma threshold that we need to claim a confident detection. Um, but this is very exciting. And as these, uh, as this pulsar timing array network continues to take data, we will be able to claim more significance in the next sort of three to five years. So these work using these pulsars, these kind of lighthouses that I was talking about earlier. And because they are so consistently uh, giving out these pulses, we can use them kind of as clocks. And if you have several of them situated around the earth, you can monitor how they're moving and use them as kind of a big network of, um, of yeah, these sort of lighthouses that monitor how the space time is wobbling. And finally, in terms of future detectors, we have the uh, laser interferometer space antenna, which is due for launch in 2035. So what this animation is showing is the sun at the center of the solar system. And then this is the earth, the blue dot. And that triangle following it is the LISA detector. So this detector will have three corner stations, and then it will shoot lasers between these corner stations as it trails the earth in an orbit, which is just, it sounds so sci-fi and crazy, but it's gonna happen in the next 10 years. I guess it's mad. Um, okay. I have a few frequently asked questions, kind of inspired by my mom asking me questions at dinner the other day. She asked me, is a wormhole the same as a black hole? And my answer to that is, you can't really tell from the outside. A wormhole connects some bit of space to another bit of space, but because it looks like a black hole, you'd have to go inside it to find out, and then you wouldn't be able to tell anyone because you wouldn't be able to send any signals back. So you have to go and find out. Um, is spaghettification real? Yes. It is worse for a small black hole because spaghettification happens because the force of gravity at your feet is much higher than the force of gravity at your head. And so it stretches you out. And this is worse for a small black hole because the change in gravity is much steeper. And so the difference is much steeper. You would still get spaghettified for a larger black hole, but it wouldn't be until you were inside the event horizon. So again, you wouldn't be able to show anyone. And finally, what happens when you fall into a black hole? Well, you would appear from the outside to slow down a lot. You would get to the edge of the black hole where it would look like you stopped. And to an observer externally, you would slowly turn red as all of the light that was leaving you, reflecting off of you, gets red shifted by the gravity of the black hole. And then slowly you would just disappear as all of those light rays finish coming off of you and no more gets emitted. Then when you go into the black hole, you probably get spaghettified and have a horrible death, but nobody will see that, so it's fine. And on that light note, I'll end the talk and um, take any other questions. Thank you. Okay, we'll, that's great. We, uh, we'll take some questions. Um, so if, we'll start with those in the room. And if you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand and I'll try and get around to you. This microphone uh, needs to be held up close to the mouth like this, otherwise it won't really work. Um, thanks for a really interesting talk. Um, you might have touched on this point when you, um, pardon me, talked about the pulsars at the end, pulsars. Um, but the LIGO detectors you described are using displacements in space, distance, rather than time. And you're talking about um, gravitational waves disturbing space and time. Mm. Um, are any detectors looking at using um, displacements in time rather than space? Yeah. Um, so with the LIGO detectors, they're kind of actually timing the distance, the, the time that it takes the light to travel because light always travels at a constant speed. So it's the distance that changes and then changes the amount of time that it takes. So they're using that timing effect kind of instead of the spatial effect actually 
in the LIGO detectors. Um, with the spatial effect, because all of the constituents of the detector are made of matter, um, and these differences we're looking for are smaller than the scale of an atom. So you need to use the timing effect instead of the matter effect to actually make the detections. I don't know if, if that makes sense, but. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, when you showed those, um, the, the graphs and the sounds of the, uh, of the events, they happen very, very quickly. Is, is that, like, is, is a black, two black holes really merging in a few seconds? Well, it depends when you start timing the merger because these black holes have been together for some amount of time. In the dynamical case, they can become bound in their final pair perhaps a few days before they merge. Whereas in the isolated case or sometimes in the dynamical case, um, just in sort of wider connections, they can become bound hundreds, thousands of years before they merge. But it's just because of the frequency sensitivity of the detectors. We can only detect the gravitational radiation from 10 Hertz and above. Gravitational waves are twice the orbital frequency. So this means that we're only detecting them from when their orbital frequency is five Hertz and above. So the system is going from five Hertz to whatever its merger frequency is, a few hundred Hertz in a fraction of a second. But before that, it's also had this whole other life that we try to infer, but that we can't actually see any of because we don't have any frequency sensitivity below about 10 Hertz. Hi, um, first of all, I want to thank you for the presentation. It was brilliant. And I have actually a couple of questions. So one is actually how you started uh, kind of um, becoming passionate about physics. And the second one, and apologies if we already touched base on that, but do we know how long a black hole lasts? Or do we know about the timing of black holes? Okay, I'll answer your second question first. Okay. When you say how long does a black hole last, do you mean due to Hawking radiation? <laughs> so black holes um, very, very slowly lose energy. And they do this through the process of Hawking radiation. So this is essentially when you have an empty vacuum, you have particles popping in and out of existence. So you have an antimatter particle and a matter particle that will pop into existence and then annihilate each other immediately. And when this happens on the edge of a black hole, one of the particles gets sucked into the black hole and the other one escapes. And this causes the black hole to lose energy. So over a very, very long time, the black hole shrinks. But this happens on a time scale so long that the universe will be uninhabitable by the time that actually happens. Like the universe will have expanded so much that no planet will exist close to a star or be getting any energy from a star at that point. So it takes a very long time. Well, with the gravitational waves, for example, we're seeing black holes merge and form other black holes. So in that sense, I guess we've seen black holes forming. In the case of supermassive black holes, we don't really know how they form. It could be that they formed due to um, fluctuations in the density field in the early universe, or it could be that they form due to accretion and massive mergers and repeated mergers. But this is something that we're trying to look into and actually, it's very exciting that we've seen this formation of an intermediate mass black hole because we hadn't seen a black hole in this range before. We'd only really seen sort of stellar mass black holes and things that had tens of times the mass of the sun. And then the supermassive black holes, which have millions of solar masses. So we really needed to see some steps in between. And this one that we've seen forming in gravitational waves is the only one we've seen so far, confidently. Um, so yeah, that's another thing that can hopefully be answered um, with gravitational waves. Uh, I'll answer your first question now. So I started doing physics at university because I did badly in my physics exams at school, in my A-levels. I did um, art, English, and physics. And, and yeah, physics was the only one I didn't get an A or an A star in. So I went to uh, show it that I could do it at university. 
And then when I was at university, I did a internship with a software engineering company and I realized I really loved coding. And then during my final year, um, the announcement of gravitational waves being detected for the first time was made. A few days before I was supposed to hand in an essay that I'd just written on gravitational waves. And so I'd written this whole essay not knowing the gravitational waves have just been detected. And so I had to rewrite this whole essay with a couple of days to spare, which was stressful, but also quite exciting. And so that kind of gave me the bug for gravitational waves. <laughs> How many galaxies do we know that have now have multiple black holes? Because this must, must bear on the expectation for the number of massive black hole binaries that you expect. Yeah. Um... Well, I know of one galaxy that has two supermassive black holes. In terms of galaxies that have multiple black holes, we can't resolve the smaller ones unless they're in systems that are either emitting electromagnetic emission due to accretion or something like that, or because they're in binaries, um, in binary black hole systems and they merge. So we don't have a good understanding of how many black holes we expect to be in different galaxies. I, I recall a couple of years ago that I think it was NGC 6240 had uh, three black holes, three supermassive black holes. Yeah. That's simple. But I just, <laughs> I just wondered if the number had gone up at all. But uh, uh, well, I yeah. am not somebody who focuses on supermassive no, black no, holes, but no. I haven't heard of a galaxy with more than three supermassive black holes. So quick, uh, hopefully two part question. Um, first one is, of the detected binary uh, gravitational waves, what proportion are um, dynamical versus isolated? How does that align with theory? Um, and then secondly, can you talk a little bit more around the conditions, the separate conditions uh, of the stellar universe around them that would enable the two different types to form? Hmm. Yes. Okay. Very good questions. So the first question was what fraction? This is very uncertain at the moment. We think that there is probably a mixture, but it's very hard to make this statement of exactly what the fraction is because there are several different dynamical environments and each has a different predicted fraction of eccentric sources, for example. So in globular clusters, we expect to see 4% of the mergers that are produced in globular clusters with a detectable eccentricity. However, in active galactic nuclei, we expect up to 70% to, to be detectably eccentric, but it depends on the conditions in the active galactic nucleus. So this is a very difficult number to pin down. There are multiple things you can look at. You can look at the predicted mass distributions, the predicted spin distributions, you can look at the predicted mass ratios, for example. But all of these things are, although we do have predictions for them, the predictions vary depending on the physics that you assume. So there's a lot of assumptions going on. So I think the numbers are something like between five and 25% could be dynamical or something like that. But this number will change varying, yeah, depending on what you assume about the uh, the, the situation that your binaries are forming in. And then your second question was about the conditions that allow these binaries to form. Is this specifically isolated or dynamical or both? Okay. So in the isolated case, you have to invoke special procedures. So one thing that you have to, well, one thing that you can invoke is something called chemically homogeneous evolution. And what this is, is when you have a very rapidly spinning star, you can mix up the layers. So what normally happens when a star expands is that one layer expands a lot and the rest of them don't move so much. Whereas if you mix up those layers, then the star can stay very compact. It doesn't expand so much. And this can lead the two stars to be much closer together throughout their whole evolution. Another thing you can do in isolated evolution is you can do common envelope evolution. And this is when one of the stars expands a lot and it engulfs the other star in its envelope and its expanded kind of gaseous material. But this doesn't destroy the other star. 
It maybe strips it of some of its layers, but it doesn't destroy it completely. And in this case, this can actually bring the binary closer together, um, as well as allowing it to stay bound and then evolve into a compact binary. In the other case, you need, um, so in the dynamical case, you do need a quite compact environment. I think you need an environment with an escape velocity of 50 kilometers per second or something of that order. Um, in the core of a globular cluster, I think it's 500 times denser than our local region of the universe or something like that. But you don't, so for example, in a young cluster or in a, in a not very dense cluster, you won't have very efficient production of binaries. You really need these quite compact environments. Otherwise, you just don't get the conditions for the, the binaries are not forming because the black holes aren't encountering each other at close enough proximity. Hi, thank you. Um, do gravitational waves interact with each other? And can you tell? Yes, they do. Um, yeah, so you can have echoes. Um, you can have gravitational lensing of gravitational waves. And you can also have gravitational wave memory. So echoes are something where it sort of reflects off of a boundary, which might be to do with another black hole being in the vicinity. Um, the gravitational lensing would cause two similar signals to be detected at a slight offset in time. And gravitational wave memory can be seen when the baseline of the detector, like the baseline strain level is changed after the signal passes through. So gravitational wave memory refers to a permanent deformation of space-time that happens due to the passage of gravitational waves. And it is predicted by general relativity, so it should happen, but we haven't detected it yet. Thanks. All right. Also, I'll take uh, two more questions from the room then, and then I'll see what's on the chat channel. Thanks. Um, you've been talking about um, uh, global, global clusters as possible sources of these uh, these these pairs. Um, we have a number of global clusters quite conveniently close you know, to, to our Earth. Um, have any black holes been detected in them? And if not, why not? No, they haven't. Um, part of, well, there are several reasons that they couldn't be. Um, one of them is that we wouldn't expect there to be a high rate of binary mergers in these clusters. So the real advantage of globular clusters is that although they aren't producing binary black holes at a very high rate, there are many, many thousands of galaxies with many, many hundreds of globular clusters inside them. So although each one isn't producing a very high rate, one of them at some point will be because there are just so many of them. We can't currently pinpoint where the mergers are happening, except for in the case of the binary neutron star merger, where we could see where it was. That was very convenient. Um, but when we only have the gravitational wave detections, the regions of the sky, the sky volumes that we're looking at, are like 500 Olympic swimming pools worth of volume. Like it's, it's a really huge amount of space that we're looking at, and we can't pinpoint it exactly. But wouldn't even single black holes be detectable within the global cluster in terms of the distortion that you would see of the light around them? A black hole would be detectable if it passed in front, if it passed in between the telescope and the cluster. If it's in the center of the cluster, then no, because it's just, it's too densely populated. You're just seeing so much light that you can't even resolve individual stars. So if any of the light from those stars is warping at all, you can't tell because there are too many stars between you and the black hole anyway. There have been some claims looking at how stars move in clusters. There was a claim for potentially an intermediate mass black hole at the center of a cluster, but that was equally well explained by just a dense core of stars in the cluster and you couldn't tell by the light. Um, I understand how you go about um, uh, detecting the gravitational waves. That was very clear. What I don't understand is how you actually point your telescope in the sky to, mm. to, to, to see them or how you, how you identify where in the sky is the source of the, the waves. Yes. OK, great question. So the telescopes are static. They don't move at all. We can look 
at different well we can we can kind of pinpoint where things are on the sky as i just mentioned not very well but we can try to vaguely understand where they're coming from because we have multiple detectors and so because gravity travels at the speed of light there is a slight time offset between the signals arriving at the different detectors wow. and actually on the plots that i had of the first detection they said um I think they had like data from H1 and then data from L1 brackets shifted inverted. Yes. And that was because of that time delay. So in order to get them to actually overlap, you have to shift them in time and also invert them because yeah, you're seeing them from different angles, essentially. That's why you had to invert them. So when we have three detectors online, we can get really good localization. When CAGRA is sensitive enough, we'll get even better localization. We really need a detector in the Southern hemisphere to help us with the localization, but we don't have one at the moment. Um, when we only have one detector online, the potential sky location is like almost the entire sky. So it's, yeah, it's not Happy. great. When we Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. And well, the first question I have is pretty much exactly the same as that. That's from Deepali. How do detectors focus in particular objects? So you've just answered that, I think. Um, Next one is from Roger Moses. How much more sensitive is the current LIGO than the Weber detector? Has anyone ever explained the Weber or Weber results? Um, so I'm not sure how to compare the sensitivities because they're very different instruments. So the Weber bar or the Weber bars were designed to resonate at the frequency of the gravitational wave that was passing through. So they were only sensitive to one frequency. I think he built maybe seven or 10 of them or a range of them for different frequency ranges. Um, but he, but each of those detectors could only detect one frequency. Um, and yeah, no one was ever able to reproduce the results. He didn't fully understand all of his sources of noise, I think, is the conclusion that people came to afterwards. Um, the bars themselves were not particularly well isolated. So in the gravitational wave detectors that we have now, the mirrors are suspended, they're on isolation tables, um, and we also model all of the noise sources that we know about at the detectors, and then we monitor those noise sources. So we're able to really well understand the noise and subtract it, which makes us a lot more sensitive than we would otherwise be. And Weber wasn't taking into account all of the possible noise sources. So we think that there was just some noise that he wasn't taking into account. Right, so uh, Gary asks, we know from the history of epicycles that you can adjust a model to fit any waveform. So how confident are you that the models you use to predict the black hole properties from the observed waveforms are actually correct? They're correct to our current level of noise. Um, so there is a whole team within the LIGO Virgo collaboration that looks into testing general relativity by checking how well our predictions match with the data. And at the moment, when you subtract the models from general relativity from the data, you end up with Gaussian noise. So this means that any deviations from general relativity are below our current noise level. However, as we get more sensitive detectors, we will become more sensitive to any differences between our predictions and the signals we're actually detecting, which will tell us whether our models are right, whether our simulations are behaving, and whether Einstein was right as well. Um, and Eileen Clark asks, what's the difference between kilonovas and supernovas, please? Okay, yes. Um, supernovae are the deaths of massive stars when they explode. Kilonovae are when two neutron stars crash together and emit a big burst of energy. And so supernovae and kilonovae can both create heavy elements, um, but kilonovae have been shown now to produce quite a high quantity of um, precious metals and other interesting elements. Are there any more questions in the room? All right. Well, can I give you the microphone? I'm going to have to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the people on Zoom. 
Mm-hmm. Yes. Oh, sorry, um, excuse me, could you repeat the question? For yeah, the sure. So the question was, um, what happens to the angular momentum of the in-spiraling system after it merges? So this goes into the final spin of the black hole. So if you actually do simulations of what happens, you end up showing that most black holes after the merger, most remnant black holes will have a spin, well, a dimensionless spin of around 0.7, which I'm just realizing now doesn't really mean anything. Um, but I guess a spin of one is like the maximum spin. So it's like 70% of the maximum spin a black hole could possibly have. Um, also, the angular momentum can turn into a kick, which means that the final black hole moves very suddenly in a certain direction. And this can actually prohibit the formation of subsequent mergers if it's in a dynamical environment. If it gets a really strong kick from the merger, it can be kicked out of the globular cluster or out of whatever environment it's in, so it can no longer merge again. So yeah, there are two primary things that can happen. It can spin up the remnant and it can kick the remnant out of its environment. Oh, the universe explodes. So... Right. Do we have any more questions in the room? Right. Uh, yes. Can I ask, uh, the subject is obviously very cutting edge and up to the minute. And um, you talked about the LIGO detectors. I was wondering if the James Webb telescope played any part or doesn't it have the equipment on it? To yeah, it's, it's looking, James Webb Telescope is only electromagnetic. Right. Um, so it hasn't been looking at any of the systems that we've been looking at. Um, yeah, I think that there could be collaborations in the future if there are future um, binary neutron star events and James Webb happens to be looking in the right place. But it takes quite a lot of effort to make it look in a different place and there's quite a lot of lead time and because lots of people want to use James Webb so they want to Absolutely. you know you have to book your slot months in advance and things so, yeah uh, hi thanks I was just wondering how all this activity is going to take place in the central galaxies how far to the edge of the galaxy can these things uh, move to if that makes any sense can they pull the galaxies around uh are you talking about the black hole remnants uh, well the black holes uh, uh, yeah that you've described at central galaxies and uh, are they inevitably in the middle-ish of a galaxy oh the black holes that are merging in the center of galaxies or single ones or single ones um so the central black hole of the galaxy is influencing how the galaxy moves, um, but it's not the only thing influencing how the galaxy moves. There's uh, quite a famous result where if you only use the mass at the center of the galaxy, including the supermassive black hole, to predict how the mass at the edge of the galaxy should be behaving, it isn't moving in the same way. And that's been chalked up to dark matter. Um, but yeah, so the, the central black holes are influencing it, but they're not wholly responsible for the way that the galaxy moves. Is there, is there any way to predict where a gravitational wave might be coming from next so that you know, like, I know, to switch it on and look in the right place? Um, not at the moment. Um, however, in the future, when we have things like LISA, LISA will be able to see much lower frequencies. And so it will be able to tell us where we can expect to see gravitational waves coming from in the future in the LIGO detectors and the higher frequency detectors. So that's pretty exciting. Um, we won't necessarily be able to focus the detectors on that region of the sky, but we could have some 
electromagnetic telescopes following that region of the sky, um, looking for any electromagnetic counterparts. Because while we don't expect to see electromagnetic counterparts from binary black hole mergers, if they're merging in a gaseous environment, for example, then there might be some kind of electromagnetic signal that we could detect and learn from. Um, so yeah, we could we can use it for, for useful things like that. Right, okay. Hi, thank you. In your answer to the previous but one question, you said that if you look at the supermassive black hole in the center mm -hmm. and look at how the stars are moving around in the arms, mm -hmm. if you consider only the central mass as influencing the motion, you said that had been talked up into dark matter. I, I wonder what you meant by that talked up. And are you suggesting there isn't dark matter or we don't really know how much there no, is? No, I'm not suggesting that at all. <laughs> no, I'm, what I'm saying is that has been chalked up to something we call dark matter, but we don't know what dark matter is. So I could equally well say that's been chalked up to we don't know what is going on here. But we know dark matter exists, but we just don't know what it is. Right. Yeah, we'll here first, and oh, was this about the same? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so, I, I mean, we don't know what dark matter is. That's why we call it dark matter. And we see movements that we can't explain otherwise, and we speculate something that we can't see. And it's really just a label for it. So I'm not quite sure if I can ask for a little bit more explanation of why we know there is dark matter if it's not because of the movement of the stars in the outer arms of, of a spiral. Oh, no. So I think what I'm saying is this was the first evidence for dark matter. And then we saw this pattern repeated in other galaxies and in other places. So we know that there is something that we don't understand and we call it dark matter. And so we're looking for that thing and it's it's just an easy term to call it dark matter because it's a thing, we don't understand it. It behaves like matter, but other than that, we don't seem to be able to detect it. So that's that's all I'm saying is we know dark matter exists because we've seen the evidence for it, but we don't understand it. So you you eloquently showed that the the difference um, in the eccentricity um, caused different waveform patterns when you're looking at isolated versus um, the other um, component dynamical component. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that how the parameterization process would change when you're looking at? Because for the isolated, it's that nice, clean, almost Fourier like output, whereas for the dynamical, it's clearly much more difficult to be able to to fit and interpret the parameters. Yes, you are correct. It is much more difficult to fit and interpret the parameters. Um, when you add extra parameters to your simulations, it changes the complexity a lot, and it increases the time that it takes to produce these simulations. What we actually have is numerical relativity simulations. Each numerical, numerical relativity simulation of one waveform can take months. We need to generate hundreds and thousands of waveforms to do these parameter estimation processes. And so we have waveform approximants, which are approximate descriptions of numerical relativity waveforms that are much faster, that take something like a microsecond to generate. And these are validated against numerical relativity waveforms. And we have a lot of these approximants for circular systems. And we don't have very many numerical relativity waveforms that have eccentricity, at least covering the full range of eccentricity. And so it's hard to validate the limited approximants that we have that contain eccentricity against numerical relativity waveforms because we don't have so many of them. And this is because traditionally we expected to only really detect circular waveforms um, because gravitational waves efficiently remove energy from the orbit. But Recently, there's been more interest in eccentric waveforms, so this field is developing, but it's very slow. And so it does get more complicated, but I'm hoping 
that the process will get faster. But we've had to do, yeah, some some kind of tricky things to get around the slowness of these waveforms in our parameter estimation processes, which I won't I won't go into the technical detail, but there's had to be a little bit more uh, creative engineering, I'll say. Right, we're getting near nine o'clock, uh, so we could take another question or so if there's any more, but maybe we've reached the natural end. Well, in that case, I'm, I must say how stunned I am by the richness of this, that this field has suddenly developed into. I mean, only yesterday, it seemed to be an entirely new field, and now you've exposed to us this in, <laughs> in, incredible richness in development and characterizing different sorts of uh, black hole biographies and so on. Uh, there's going to be a lot for us to think about. So let's um, show our appreciation to 